Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Also, uh, the day that we recognize the fathers and father figures in our lives. So, uh, welcome to families. Welcome uh, to our fathers and other honored guests this morning. We are glad to be able to gather together to worship the Lord uh, on this day. Um, I want to, uh, again, express a welcome to visitors and guests. If, you, if this is your first time or um, you're relatively new to our church and you would like for us to reach out to you, do note that part of the bulletin tears out. You can leave contact information there. And following the service, leave it in one of our offering plates, and we will get that and reach out to you this week. I also want to say a word of welcome to those who are joining us online. We are always glad to have you in attendance with us. Please say hello in the comments section to get a sense of of the community gathered online. Uh, this morning for giving of tithes and offerings, you can do so with the offering plates located on the sides of the stage and also in the vestibule. You can also give online at firstbaptistfarmville.org uh, or drop off or mail to the, to the church during the week. Uh, there's not a whole, whole lot of announcements uh, that are in the bulletin for today. We've had quite a busy June up to this point. In a couple weeks, our youth will be going away for a camp, so please be in prayer. Uh, for them and for their chaperones, um, but do want to, to just remind you after uh, the sermon last week about sp uh, starting back Sunday schools and small groups, if you have any interest in that, please reach out to me. Let's have a conversation. Um, I, I really think it's a, a goal for our church that we need to have, and we talked about it as deacons this past sun last Sunday evening, um, that hopefully by September we will have uh, some sort of Sunday school for all age groups going on Sunday mornings, again in the process of starting small groups and homes and such. And so if you have interest in any of those or questions about that, please reach out to me and I would love to talk to you about it. At this time, I would like to invite you though to join your hearts with me in prayers. We begin this time of worship. God, we give you thanks and praise uh, for your presence always uh, with us. We give you thanks for the ways that you have provided for us and go before us uh, and call us down the path that we are to, to go with our lives. Um, Lord, today as we gather to worship you, we pray that as we seek you, that we will find you. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning. This morning, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be reading from Psalm 103, 13 through 18. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are, we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. 
but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. This is the word of God for the people of God. Now I would like to invite you to stand as we sing our song of praise, uh, which is hymn number 542 in our hymn book, My Life is in You, Lord. I'd like to direct your attention to the back of our bulletin, to our prayer list, as we enter into a time of prayer. Uh, we will begin with a, a, a silent time of, of prayer and reflection, and I invite you in this time to lift up names on the prayer list, also those that uh, might not be on our prayer list, but you hold in your hearts. Let us pray. God, we continue to give you praise and honor and glory, and we express our thanks to you on this day and uh, for all the many ways that you have shown up in our lives, that you've provided for us. And God, let us remember that you're the one who spoke everything into being. You're the one who created and said that it's good. You're the one who sent your son Jesus as our Savior, bringing your very self to this earth to save the ones you love. 
And it's you who's gifted us with your Holy Spirit to dwell in us and to give us guidance in life. God, let us remember that that Spirit that lives in us is the very Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. It is powerful, it is mighty, and it's part of our inheritance as your children, and we give you thanks. Lord, there is nothing that lies before us uh, that we can't handle with you. And there's nothing that is from our past uh, that you desire for us to carry. You ask us to put it in your hands, and so we pray that we would have courage to do it today. Lord, as we come to you right now and place our brothers and sisters in our church and in our community in your hands, we know that you are capable of taking care of them. We pray for healing, and we thank you for those ways that we see it. We thank you for the very visible ways this morning that we see your provision and your healing power. God, we pray for those who are suffering and those who are going through hard things, that they would fix their eyes upon you. They will remember that there is no uh, valley that they can go in that is deep enough to be away from your presence and your love and your care. God, we pray for miracles. We pray for healing. We pray for restoration. And we pray that you would show us how we can be part of that, how we can be your hands and feet, how we can remind our brothers and sisters that you're there with them. So we give you all these things this morning. And we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This time I invite you to stand as we sing our song of worship, What a Beautiful Name.
first I want to start by saying thank you. Um, we did, Brian and I received the love offering this week. And we have been blessed over and over and over and over again by all of you. Um, and I cannot tell you how grateful we are to be a part of this family. We are exactly where we need to be. God has proven that over and over and over again. And we love each of you. And it is a great day because Brian is here with us worshiping in person instead of online. <laughs> so just from Brian, Ron and I both, we love all of you and thank you. And please continue with the prayers because we still have recovery to go, but he is doing great. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, so our New Testament lesson today is coming from Luke 15, 17 through 24. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but is now found. So the party began. This is the word of the Lord. Praise his holy name. Now, if I can have all my kids plus Avery and Haley come down. Right there. Good morning. I saw that. What day is today? It's Father's Day. So should we just treat it like any old day? No? Well, Haley says no. What about the rest of you? Should we treat it like any old day, Luke? Should we do something special? Lily's like, mm-hmm, absolutely. We are going to do something special today. So we're going to say thank you and that we love you to all of our fathers. So all of you come up. I won't make my teenagers do it if you don't want to, but my three little ones come up. Come on. Okay, yes, I will. Yes. Right here, Lily. Not yet. All right, I want y'all to shout out real loud, we love you. One, two, three. We love you. We love you. All right, can we do it a little bit louder one more time? We love you. Okay, thank you guys. We do want to say we love our fathers. And a lot of times our fathers um, kind of get overlooked sometimes. You know, we're like, Dad, we need you to fix this. Or, Dad, we need money. Or, Dad, we need this. We forget sometimes how much they give to us. And we take it for granted sometimes. So today we want to honor our fathers and tell you thank you. Regardless of whether you have biological children, stepchildren, nephews, uncles, or you have honorary titles. In this church, all of you gentlemen have served the role of father in some way, shape, or form. And we love you and thank you for that. So as we do with our mothers, our gentlemen, please, if you're able, stand up. Now come on. Um, my, my group here is going to start passing out the Father's Day gifts. Y'all help. And so make sure, do not sit down until you have a gift. Haley, I'm going to ask you to go up. Avery, I'm going to ask you to go this way.
for the love that you all give to everyone, to all of the kids down here, to your nieces, your nephews, your sons, daughters, everybody. Thank you for the love you give. Thank you for showing them who God is through your acts. We love you all, and we hope you have a wonderful, happy Father's Day. Let's pray. Creator God, thank you so much for all of these gentlemen. Thank you for the love they have for you and the love they have for all of our kids. Lord, help that love spread and grow, and let us take your word and your message from this church and spread it throughout the world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, choir. As the choir is returning to sit with the congregation, I would like to invite you to say hello to the folks around you. When the music comes to an end, that's a sign to get back to your pews.
Before I get into my sermon this morning, you'll see that the title of the sermon is What God as Our Father Means to Us. And so I know we might have some in the congregation think, okay, we're getting a Father's Day sermon, but back on Mother's Day, we got an Agriculture 101 sermon. So what's up with that? In fact, I had one church member that wasn't too happy about that. And they came to me and they were like, why didn't you preach a Mother's Day sermon? And I had to do a little thinking about that. And, you know, Mother's Day and Father's Day are not really church holidays, but they're not a one that a, a senior pastor dare take out off unless they've been there for a long time. So I never really got to fill in for uh, at the places that I served on Mother's Day and Father's Day. And so um, I, I told that uh, to the person and then they said, well, if you want to be pastor at First Baptist Church, as long as you say you want to, you're going to have to learn how to preach a Mother's Day sermon. <laughs> so I told Gina that we would make sure that next year we had a really good Mother's Day sermon. I love you. So uh, I, I really hadn't set out to, like, you know, go all, you know, all in on a, on a Father's Day sermon, but I've been looking at a series that I want to preach uh, through a couple passages in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah asks these big questions of God. And then this past week, as I was studying and preparing for that, I thought, you know, and I, I was drawn to this passage in Romans 8, 9 through 16, and we see in this passage God as, as, as Abba, God as Father. And so it just kind of naturally built in my preparation there to, to bring this sermon today. So this kind of does, uh, over the next couple of weeks, um, uh, next Sunday sermon and then the one after that, uh, we're going to be looking at Jeremiah, but this one today has a lot to do with what we're going to talk about then. So just kind of put file that away in your mind a little bit, if you would, this morning. The passage we're going to look at this morning is Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 16. I'm going to reference several passages this morning. And um, many are not on the screen, but do note there are new pew Bibles that are in the pews and they correspond page number wise to where I'm at in my preaching Bible. And so, for instance, uh, right now we're, we're going to be looking at the bottom of page 971. Obviously, this, this scripture is on your screen, but when, we, when I reference the others, I'll also mention the page number. So if you want to make sure the pastor is preaching what he says he's reading from, you can, you can follow right along there in your uh, pew Bible uh, that is in uh, the pews there. You might have to share as well if you're sitting close to several people. But we see here uh, in Romans chapter 8 verses 9 through 16 that Paul writes, uh, you however are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of His Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In this passage, we see several things that, that Paul reminds us uh, that affect us if God is our Father. If we live according to that and understand that God is our Father, the first thing that we see is that we are to know that we are part of of a spiritual family. Turn to somebody and, and say, you're part of the family. Remind them this morning, you are part of the spiritual family. 
I want you to turn, if you would, to uh, page 1025 in your Bible, if you, in your pew Bible, if you want to follow along. I want to, to show you something in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1 through 2. In, in 1 and 2 Timothy, Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a younger person who's been called to ministry, and he's encouraging him. And he's encouraging him in, 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 in ways to help build the church up, ways that the church should function, and ways that people should function together. And in 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 through 2, we hear, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. We have outlined here by Paul in, in 1 Timothy, as, as we see th all throughout the Scriptures, that when we're in a spiritual family with one another, that we relate to one another, not simply as people who happen to be part of the same organization, but we relate to one another as brothers and sisters, and even as mothers and fathers. You know, on a day like today, Father's Day, today is the seventh Father's Day that I've uh, celebrated my father um, without him being present. And, and it's, it's gradually gotten easier to do that. One of the reasons is I know where my father is, and I know that I will see my dad again. I also had a really good father who instilled many good things in me. I'm also blessed to have a father-in-law, a stepfather-in-law, and a brand new stepfather. Relatively brand new. It's a year and a half. A year and a half is still brand new, right? Yeah. In the grand scheme of like, you know, I'm 39 years old. So yeah, he's relatively, relatively brand new. I have these relationships of, of, of men who continue to pour into uh, my life. I told uh, Papa, that's uh, Gina's dad, we were seeing him yesterday, and I, I told him, I said, thank you for continuing to be a father figure in my life. You mean so much to me. But it's not, it's not only him. There there are men from my past, men who taught me in Sunday school growing up in the church, First Baptist Church in Scotland Neck. Uh, there are professors who ha have made the leap from just being a professor to being um, a, a spiritual role model in my life. There are other pastors that have done the same. There are men here at this church um, who, who, who encourage me and I see as like a father figure in my life. And I'm very so thankful for those people. I and mean, it's the same thing with mothers. I mean, I grew up with a lot of moms, didn't I, Gina? When Gina first met them all, she was like, this is my, uh, Graham's other mother, and other mother, and other mother. It was a lot of them. And a lot of times within the church, we think of, oh, the, you know, you grow up in the church, you're going to have a lot of church moms. But you also ought to have a lot of church dads as well. We are part of a spiritual family, not just an organization that gets together. So we are called to encourage one another. You know what's going to happen? What happens in families? You end up getting squabbles, right? Conflict. I always tell people when I do marriage counseling with them that conflict is normal within relationship. It's how you deal with it, right? It's how you handle it. I'm thankful for the conflict that I've had within the spiritual communities that I've grown up in. Because it's through love and forgiveness. It's through coming to understanding. It's through learning how to humble myself within the family, being part of a spiritual family that have, that have actually grown. It's not easy to put yourself in that position. It's actually easy to, to get in a little bit of a conflict and have a scapegoat to leave the spiritual community and go and do your own thing and say, you know, I don't need the church family. I don't need to grow along with other believers. I'm fine just growing by myself. I got, you know, this channel, you know, and this teacher, and I listen to their thing, and I send a vow or whatever they ask me to do, and, and, and this is my church family, but we don't see that in the New Testament. We see that the family is the people who spend time together, who, who, who yearn to be together, not because it's going to be perfect or easy all the time, but that's actually the way that we grow. Amen? Somebody hear that this morning? There's been times in my life when, when I've been frustrated with, 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 with church, you know, I've shared, I shared it with some folks this past week. There was a time that I served at a church, and it, it was a rough go, and I thought about leaving ministry. But then God put some other fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters around me to help me heal, to love me, to encourage me, to remind me that the spiritual family is God's plan. The church is God's plan. So we see that. God is our Father, it means we're part of a family. If God is our Father, it means that our obligation is to live according to the Spirit and not the flesh. 
We don't like that word usually. Obligated. It, it communicates to us drudgery or something we have to do that we don't want to do. But Paul uses it here as something that exhorts or encourages one to live as one ought. We see it in verses 12 through 14. Therefore, brothers and sisters, what's he speaking about? Therefore, therefore, if God is our Father, if we live within the spiritual family, we are born not of the flesh, but we are born of the Spirit when we trust in Jesus that ushers us into the family, the spiritual family. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to live according to the flesh, not to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if you live by the Spirit, uh, you will put to death the misdeeds of the body, and you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Flip over to page 995 real quick, if you will. Over on page 995, we find ourselves in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 20, where Paul writes, For Christ's love compels us. If we live according to the Spirit, we're going to be compelled not by the things of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and the things we lust after and the things we want more than others. And this person sinned against me, so I need to sin against them. But if we live in according to the Spirit, verse 14, Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all have died. What does that mean? Jesus died for us. We died to our sin to have life in Christ. Verse 15, And He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. What does that mean? It's easy to count one's sins against them, isn't it? Especially in a small town like this when everybody knows everybody's baggage, right? I bet you can make a laundry list of the people you see in this room. Couldn't you? You could probably only after two years you can make a laundry list of me. All right, me and Gina talk all the time. I have to get outside. Luke, leave out, come in. And Gina will be like, I wonder what Frankie thinks about us. And you know, I mean, because look, we're imperfect, right? And I've told y'all before, I'm a yelling dad, okay? So you hear me outside trying to round round up my kids, it's gonna be a loud voice, all right. But we don't regard our we don't regard one another in those ways. We see each other as brothers. And sisters. And they saw Christ in that way, didn't they? He's the one who went and ate with sinners. He's the one who they thought was trying to flip everything upside down and do away with all the prophets and all the way that God had worked in the past. He said, no, I'm actually here to fulfill the law. They regarded Christ in that way. So we're, no, we're called to no longer regard each other according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, which means that we call out the spiritual gifts in our brothers and sisters. We look at one another and we see, see that we have all been created in the image of God, especially when we're at our worst, especially when we have fallen. We have to keep that at the forefront of our mind. Not so much so that, 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 we, that, that, we, that we think about who we once were and we keep living according to that, but maybe like Matthew, who keeps reminding the readers, Matthew, I'm the tax collector. I'm the one who was, I'm the one who was collecting more than I should have collected from the people. He remembers who he was, but he also remembers who he is now and how it looks to live out the calling that God has in his life. And then we hit this, this famous scripture if you're following along, you see it right there on page 995, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come and the old has gone. The new is here. We are brand new in Christ. All this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And he goes on to say that we are called to be ambassadors of reconciliation. So what does that mean for us? Wherever we go, wherever we find relationship, we are called to, to restore things. We're called to ask forgiveness, to, 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 to give forgiveness. We are called to, to, to see places in our communities, places in our families, in our own homes, places even across the world. Maybe we're not able to go immediately and, and, and give to it. Maybe we can give to a need and at least give our prayers for all the ways that we see the kingdom of God being squashed. And be ushers and ambassadors for that. If you're taking notes, 
This is where we stand. What God as our Father means to us is that we are part of a spiritual family. That our obligation is to live according to the Spirit and not the flesh. And thirdly, as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, we are heirs of God. We are heirs of God. We have an inheritance from God. You know, I didn't think about that sort of thing when I was growing up about an inheritance and what people might leave behind. And, and, but now as I've gotten older and have kids of our own, you know, we think about not necessarily what we're going to get from you know, the people who are before us, but what we're going to leave behind for the first time, you know, over probably the past decade, thinking about an inheritance and what it means to be an heir that's coming to the forefront of our minds. But it's always been at the front of God's mind when he relates to us. If you want to follow along with me, uh, turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 29. That's page 1003 in your Bibles. Again, that's Galatians 3, 26 through 29. Paul talks a little bit about this there. He says, In Christ Jesus you are all children of God through your faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, uh, who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. We just saw that. We right, have become a new creation. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All the things that separate, that we categorize one another, those things don't matter. We are one. Remember last week, the one, one, remember we did that last week in the scripture? We talked about how all these ways that we are called to be one. And then he, he wraps it up in verse 29, this little section. He says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Father Abraham had many sons. You know, we are children of, of Abraham. We are heirs to the promises of God. In Genesis 17, we see that God comes and makes a covenant with Abraham. He's, he's going he's to be the father of nations. Yeah, Abraham and Sarah don't have what? Kids. They don't have kids, and they're old, right? And so Sarah laughs at this. And then they named their child Isaac, which means laughter. Well, a few chapters later, in Genesis 26, Isaac has grown up, and, and he's at a place where he needs some encouragement. So God comes and reconfirms the covenant that is made to Isaac, telling him, among other things, that through his offspring, the whole world is going to be blessed. And then we see in the New Testament, we see it come to fruition through the line of Abraham, through the line of Isaac. We see that Jesus is the fruit of the covenant. And this movement's called the gospel, the good news, the blessing for all of the world. And so we're told in the scriptures that when we, and we're seeing it right here, when we put faith in Jesus Christ, we are adopted as children. Go back to, to, to Romans, to our, to our main passage. If you would pull it up on the screen. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you will live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we're children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We are heirs of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. We see in Colossians that Jesus is, is preeminent in being the firstborn from the dead. We are co-heirs with Christ that we will, we, we will live again when these earthly bodies cease. When, the Bible tells us that when we put faith in Jesus, we are born again in that instant and in that moment. And our inheritance is an eternity with God. Amen? We are heirs. Heirs to love. We are heirs to grace. We are heirs to forgiveness. We are heirs to the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We are heirs to the riches of God, to eternal life, the presence with God forever and ever and ever. And so it's standing on those things with God as our Father that he writes in the next verse. Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory 
that will be revealed in us. In the next couple of weeks, I want to ask some questions. I've told you before that part of a growing faith and an authentic faith is that we ask questions of God. That we are able to come to God with, with things that frustrate us. With things we don't know much information about and we want to know. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's normal. And God actually calls us and draws us close when we, when we have those questions. But many people have a problem with seeing God as a loving Father. Many people have a hard time seeing that they have an inheritance. Because maybe they've not had a good earthly experience. Maybe, may, maybe the father figure in their life has let them down. And so they assume and are ready for God to do the very same thing. Or maybe they've had a very critical father. And that critical father makes them think, well, God's just always critical of me. I don't know what the situation is, but I do know that uh, in my counseling studies, um, that the ways that we relate to both mother and father has a way of shaping the ways that we relate to God. And so how, what do we do with that? Well, we read the scriptures, we examine our lives, we do some reflection, and we talk to God about that. And we try to understand what we see here in the scriptures, that, that we have a God who deeply loves us, Yes, hates the sin and the brokenness and the ways that it causes destruction in our world, but has not relented in that what he began through Jesus Christ, the good news, living gospel lives, is his plan A, not a plan B, plan A for the world, and it's expressed in the community of faith. Amen? It's a good word. Okay, It's, it's from here. Look, I want to I I close with this. This past week, they had vacation Bible school in the community. And um, Levi was able to go every night. Luke had some baseball in the, that messed up the middle two nights. And, uh, but on the first night, Levi got home. He said, Daddy, Daddy, if you build your house in the desert on the sand and the rain comes, it's going to knock it down. But if you build your house on the rock, I mean on the cement, and the rain comes, it won't knock it down. And I said, who's the rock? And the first time he said, Jesus. And now his answer is God. So if you ask him, he says God. But it's, you know, it, it, the understanding there, God our Father, God our Son, the, 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 the Trinity's kind of hard for all of us, even for little kids. You know, Jesus said, Matthew 27, this is on page, if you want a page, 833, Matthew 7, 24 through 27, if... Therefore, everyone who hears these word of mine, words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Once again, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Storms come, don't they? But thanks to God, we have a Father who sustains us in the middle, who invites us to build our house on the rock. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks today for the many ways that you are continually working in our presence, working on us as individuals, working on us collectively as a church family, preparing us to be your hands and feet, to serve our community and to serve this world. God, we thank you that we are part of your plan. We thank you that uh, that you have things in store for us that we can only imagine. Give us courage to follow you into it. Give us an awareness and understanding that everything you have for us is good. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. This morning our hymn of response is hymn number 404, Faith of Our Fathers. This morning, if you um, want to make any sort of response to come to the front, uh, maybe to make a public profession of faith, uh, or maybe to join our church, or perhaps you want to come and pray at the altar or pray for another reason, I will be here to receive you in the name of Christ. Again, please stand for our hymn of response, hymn number 404.
Let us pray. God, again, we give thanks for this day of worship. We give thanks for the ways that we have met with you. And we pray that we would have courage today to not only um, enjoy the time with fathers and father figures, but to spend time in seeking you and giving you our thanks and our love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And may you go, may you go in peace. Amen.